So uh, welcome to our uh, final guest speaker of the day, Veronica Finn Bruy. Uh, Veronica holds a Bachelor's of Science uh, from the University of Ghana, or, or a University in Ghana, um, a Bachelor's of Arts from UBC, uh, and a Master of Public Health from Nottingham, and uh, LLM from York, and is concurrently completing her LLB with the University of London, and a PhD with Australia's National University, Australia, Australian National University, National Center for Indigenous Studies. At present, she is based um, at the University of Washington School of Law as a visiting research scholar. A strong advocate of interdisciplinary learning exchange, Ms. Brewey Finn has conducted research studies, consulted on projects, and spoken at international conferences in over 20 countries in Africa, Australia, Europe, Asia, and North America. She held successional teaching position at ANU College of Law for, academic, for the academic year of 2013 and 2014. And between 2011 and 2014, she taught public health law and practice as an adjunct professor, professor at UBC's School of Population and Public Health. She has published two books, two children's books, several book chapters, and peer-reviewed journal articles. So she's a very busy person, and thank you very much for coming. Uh, and in 2014, she was invited to serve as a senior researcher of the Center for Policy in Liberia, the only policy think tank in Liberia. Since 2011, she has served as the director of Flowers School of Public Health and Health Sciences. She is also a founder, editor-in-chief of the Journal of International Internal Displacement, the only scholastic platform dedicated to the plight of global IDPs. In her spare time, when she's not, in her spare time, in her spare time, when she's not <laughs> vlogging, uh, she's dancing, biking, mountain hiking, or running half marathon. Uh, Ms. Finn Brewery was born and bred, uh, is a born and bred Liberian war survivor. Uh, so thank you so much, Veronica, for joining us. Um, and we'll hand it over to you, and uh, all good? Yeah, <laughs> I didn't. I thought you just needed that bio for your website or something. <laughs> also, to give give people an idea of the presence of uh, of you. <laughs> oh, that's so beautiful. Thank you very much. I I'm always it's always a mouthful for people to introduce me. Your 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 site. I need to see your face, Heidi. Maybe you can go behind a little bit because you're too squashed to that side. Okay. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I, those in, introductions, they're usually too flattering and kind of like too long, but um, thank you so much for doing that. I appreciate uh, the opportunity to invite me to have this conversation with you guys. Uh, I really like small conversations, especially when the topics are quite intense and complicated and difficult to unravel. Um, I don't claim to be an expert in any of these things. Like all of you, we're all learners. I don't subscribe to those views of, you know, the fact that you probably have a PhD or you have a law degree means that you're any better in knowledge compared to other people. So uh, I guess it's a reflection of what you see on my resume. The fact that I always feel I have a lot more to learn. And so I never really get tired <laughs> with learning. Um, so it's going to be a, a, a discussion. I have written some notes in my, on my computer. So you see me looking here, my computer is just right here. Um, I'm pretty much exhausted and really tired from working on my uh, PhD dissertation. So forgive me if you don't find it too, um, if you don't find me on top of things, it's only because I've spent a lot of sleepless nights in the last couple of weeks trying to finish up my writing. So um, some things I would just end up reading them from over here, but um, hopefully it should all go well. And if you have any questions in between, please just interrupt me. This is more or less an informal conversation. I don't intend it to be I don't like lecture style kind of presentation. So please feel free to uh, make a statement, ask a question, interrupt me anytime, I don't mind. But the plan is I want to do a, about half an hour, 25 minutes to half an hour. And Adi, if you can just give me a note so that I can stop talking and then we can open it up because through, okay, through the discussions, what happens is um, a lot of things that I've actually alluded to or that I would not possibly be able to cover within a very short time, I'll be able to, or we will be able to discuss it through that. So, um, like I said, the topic colonialism and racism is, 
it's such massive topics and it's impossible to talk about it within a short frame of time. But um, I think my interest in these topics basically come from the fact that I grew up in Liberia. Anybody knows where Liberia is? I see three, four nodding. Oh, so that's good. That's me because usually when I ask this question, like not many people know where Liberia is. So maybe because you knew I was coming, I was doing this presentation, you all went and did your Google search. Yeah. But no, that's, <laughs> that's impressive um, because Liberia is a very, it's a relatively small country. If you usually hear about Liberia in the media, maybe in the past 10 years, 10 years ago, if you heard of Liberia, usually it would be of war. Uh, but after that, since 2005, if you have Liberia, either be because we have the first African warlords to be uh, convicted by the ICC, and we also have the first female elected president on the continent. So sometimes, and she also became the um, Nobel Peace Prize winner, I think, 2008. 2010, the last one, I can remember, but those are the two things that you probably hear Liberia of. But growing up in Liberia, I grew up in a culture of classism. It's still contentious what people think of racism amongst Black people, but there is racism within Black people because what happens with, uh, for, for example, uh, CLR, CLR James, uh, Black Jack Hobbins, um, one of the things he talked about in our book in Haiti is here is a, a revolutionary country trying to deal with decolonization and, and freedom or liberty, but still has a hierarchy of racism existing because you find that through the process of slavery, slave masters were fond of sleeping with their slave girls. And so when they did, they had mixed race children and these children tended to have a little bit more prestige in a hierarchical line of social order. And so these kids, although they had the issues of, I mean, really dehumanizing and disrespectful, violent behavior, were still given some privilege better than the person with a darker skin color. And that was exactly what was happening in Liberia. So I saw that very clearly and it's very common, but again, I was too young to understand the implications and what it really meant because there's this complete class system that exists in Liberia that, um, and I'll go into a little more detail when I give you a short overview of Liberia's history, but it's, it does have some level of racism which most black people don't feel comfortable saying, oh, I'm black because I'm always racialized, but black people do racialize other black people based on their skin tones. Um, when I left Liberia in 1992 as a, you know, fleeing from the civil war to go to Ghana, another thing that picked my, intuitions were or was I went to school in the central region of Ghana um, for my advanced level my A levels because Ghana is a uh, is a British colony as well so we have the British educational system and where my school was located in the central region there is a famous castle there called Elmina Castle and it was the depot for slip. It was built in 1492 by the Portuguese. And first when it started, it became a place for trade between Europeans and, or mostly Portuguese and uh, Africans. But with time, by the 14, 15th century, it became a hub for depositing slaves. So when the African chiefs have captured their slaves, they were run over and bring them to Elamina Casa and host them there. And that was where it was through Elamina Casa, almost all West African slaves were transported to the Americas. So I got to go, you know, I think if you go to school in the central region, you definitely have to see the Elamina Casa as one of your school trips. So I, I got to see the Elamina Casa at the close, um, close range. And 
I still remember, probably this was 94, because I did my A-levels, 94, 95. I still remember the chills on my skin, you know, standing in a very dark, small corridor of where Africans were packed and sent like sardines in chains across the America. And it was a very, very dehumanizing, very, very disrespectful space to be in. And so being in Ghana for nine years and, you know, having that first time experience of war was really, it's, it's very seldom as a black person, if you go to Elmina Castle, not to feel this overwhelming emotions. In fact, it's almost like a really negative spirit over the castle, even though they've tried to make it as, you know, clean and neat for touristic purposes, but still you just get this smell, you know, that, over 2 million plus people or 200 million plus people, you know, doing the slave trade were transported and most of them passed through that very tiny channel and passages to get on and mothers and the cells that they, hold, they held them in were very tiny and would pack up sometimes 100 people into a really tiny space. Anyways, I don't want to go on too much about it, but just trying to lay a bedrock for the essence of why I personally think a lot about colonialism and racism, why any human being will feel any sense of authority, any sense of will to do or inflict such terrible, heinous acts against other human beings only because they find their skin color to be different. I find that very interesting and very sad too, because it makes me think that humans are capable of the worst evil, but we also are capable of doing a lot of good. But how did we ever arrive at this point? So let me give you just like, you know, overview of what colonialism is, some definitions I found. And, and then I will move over to brief summary or overview of histories in these countries. It's just really, really brief, just because I don't, again, I, I don't want to take too much of the time going into details with any one particular country. That I'm going to leave out a lot of facts, um, do some homework to find out more details. And then what I would do is I have listed five mean uh, common threads that run through all our mechanisms or tools that are used to foil the whole relationship between colonialism and racism. So um, I got this definition from Stanford Dictionary Online, and it says colonialism like imperialism is a practice of domination which involves the subjugation of one people to another, or one group of people to another. Colonialism is not a modern phenomenon. It is not restricted to a specific type or place. Nevertheless, in the 16th century, colonialism changed decisively because of technological developments in navigation. So once Europeans were able to move vessels and ship and take people from one continent to another, then it became an opportunity to explore and discover other places and take authority or sovereignty to those places because people felt they had, they were subjects of the queen and they had power under the queen. They had authority, they felt that where the cultures they were coming from were more superior than the other places that they were discovering and so they were able to disperse this method of colonialism across the world and certainly England is known for uh, championing that cause because almost every aspect of the globe was covered was somehow touched by British although not all of it 
So colonialism, as we understand it today, describes the process basically of European settlement and political control over the rest of the world, including the Americas, Australia, parts of Africa, and Asia. And when it says parts of Africa, it is understood that there are two countries in Africa that were not colonized. Do you, do you know those two countries? Ethiopia. Ethiopia and Angola? No. I guess it depends on how you Wasn't it like it was very informal Who said Ethiopia and Liberia? And Liberia. Oh. <laughs> yeah, Liberia, that's what we claim. We claim that we were not colonized, but by the time I get to a little history of Liberia, I'll leave that to you to judge whether we were colonized or not. So those are the two countries historically in Africa that are not colonized. So racism, um, another terminology that is just and I don't know why, I don't know why it exists. The reality is, it's a very scientific idea. It's maybe attributed to uh, Boga science. But the fact of the matter here is, as human beings, we, we are all one race. We don't have more than one race. We are the only species that are humans. So where the whole idea of racism came from always fascinates me. I just don't understand why we as human beings will try to treat each other differently because we have different skin color when in fact our genes, our chromosomes are the same 23 pairs. We have the same blood running through our systems. We have a lot of common social behavior we have, we express the same emotions, we go through the same pain, we hurt, people are good, some people are bad, and I mean, it's just the human condition, as we said, but for some reason, people found it beneficial to look at other people because they don't look like them, because they don't have the long pointed nose, or because they don't have the long straight hair, just think that, well, it looks like being light, having a blue eye or a green eye and um, being tall or having a blonde hair makes me feel better or makes me superior to other races. And so then I have to treat them differently. Which, I mean, treating differently, it's okay because especially from a legal background to some extent, just in an office self, it's okay to treat, you know, I want to be given a little bit of a different treatment if for some reason I'm not able to get to the level of some people and they say, oh, the law is biased towards me. And like, oh, maybe because Veronica comes from this part of the world or maybe she has this ability, you know, we give her a little bit more preference, but that's positive differences. You know, like in America, they talk usually about the affirmative action, which some people don't like because we are all equal, but we would not all be equally equal, right? So to some extent, that's good. But when you start to use people's skin color at the, as a basis to really, really inflict harm and violence against them, it's, it's not acceptable. And the fact that we are all the same race, we are all the same uh, hereditary evolution trend, why is it that we are treating each other based upon something that has no foundations, no evidence, nothing of that sort. So anyways, I found an information from PBS, the um, US uh, public, uh, whatever. It says here, um, racism exists when one ethnic group or historical collectivity dominates, excludes, or seek to el eliminate another on the basis of differences that is that it believes are hereditary and alterable. So 
this group feeling that by heredity, you know, by science, by biology or biological mechanisms, you are different from another person, which is not true. And our histories are countless and countless of histories and experiences and a lot of evidence to prove that once the colonizer got into so-called primitive cultures or one that wants to discover so-called primitive primitive cultures they started to relate to people indigenous people very differently and there are stories in australia where you know a lot of indigenous australian bodies and heads were taken away and in the u.s i don't know much about canada in that regard but in the u.s as well the heads and the Body parts were taken to England to medical for to medical schools or to laboratories to be researched on because they were different. And so we will cut off the head and send them to England and we'll do research on them to find out what's actually different about them. This is another human being we are talking about. And what other reasons, honestly, because I'll keep asking myself, you know, when people criticize or critique and say, why is it that everything has to be the racial card? And then I, was, I, I keep asking myself, because I have these internal questions going on, what reason? And we will have this discussion if you have an opinion to share on it. Like, what actually, I mean, think about it. What reason will anybody think that it's okay to take another human being's head First of all, you dispossess them, take over their land, and colonize them, bring in a lot of foreign things that literally decimate or destroy them, but that's not good enough. When there was a violence or there was a war or there was some conflict between you and them, you will not only kill them and bury them in their home country, you would take their bodies and send them somewhere else because they were different. They looked like animals. They're not human beings. They're, I mean, like missionaries, pastors, religious people writing back to England and making uh, uh, alterances of how ugly and how next to beast are indigenous people. I mean, who does that? Maybe you might say it's time is, is a thing of the past, but it's important to really think about racism in the form of unconscious bias, especially in this day and age. You often will hear people say, oh, I'm not racist, I have one black friend. Oh, I'm not racist, I have an, a Canadian, a, a Muslim friend. That's not the answer to the problem. And that's not the point of racism or discrimination. The point is the historical underlinings, the undertones, and the privileges that violence, systematic violence has created in a culture so much so that you can relate to people unconsciously. It just almost come naturally. You can relate to people so in a certain way without even thinking about it. And you'd be like, oh, I didn't think about it that way. Of course you wouldn't think about it that way because these knowledge, these experiences, the way we relate to people, they've been passed down for centuries in our educational system. They're very nuanced and systematic. So it's not something so tangible. You can feel and touch like that and put your hands to it. They're so nuanced and, and systematic that you know, you're part of that system. It's a complex system. And all you think, oh, I'm just doing my thing. I'm just studying. Or oh, why should I be bothered when I have an opportunity to go to school and you don't have an opportunity and now you're on the street and now you have a child, you're a teenage pregnant and blah, blah, blah. Rather than understanding the complexity and the intricacies that surround the creation of haves and have nots or privilege and people who are underprivileged or underserved. So um, I like to, quote, to make two quotations here and why I bring these things. And in my PhD research, I highlight some of them as, as well. Why I'm bringing these things is because I think for our generation, younger generation, there is a need for us to really start thinking critically about how history has, has been created and how history has literally re-perpetuated systematic violence against indigenous people precisely. And when I talk about these, I usually refer to people who we have a lot of esteem for, people we've come to respect, people we've come to 
glorify and give them place names and, and, and speak very highly of them. But seldom do we really sit back to think critically what mindset these people had that actually led them or probably usher them into a position of power and privilege. So here is Tom Hayden writing about Winston Churchill. He said, in Winston Churchill's view, Protestant Christians were at the top above white Catholics, while Indians were higher than Africans. White Indians were higher than Africans. Churchill saw himself and Britain as being the winners in the social Darwinism hierarchy. The ingrained nature of white superiority, mostly propagated by white males, has an obliterating effect on the subjugation of, of, of indigenous people subliminally. So here is a man we all talk about as this great English man and you know, great statesman, literally responsible for the inception of the universal declaration of human rights. No, not that. I mean, the UN, sorry, because that was uh, the American, uh, what's the name? The American president's, sorry? During what? During the World declaration of human rights, the Roosevelt, uh, what's the name? The female, what's the name? Eleanor. Eleanor. Yeah, I was looking for a first name. Yeah, Eleanor was responsible for the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. But uh, uh, Churchill, after World War II, was very much, and of course, the great Canadian, I also forget his name. I think he's from uh, the Maritimes. Um, they, sorry? Humphrey. Yes, Humphrey. John Humphrey, right? He, the, both of them were all, you know, part of setting up the UN, and that's a great thing. And I'm not saying any human being is totally good or totally bad, but at the same time, it's important, and that's part of the reason we are given the opportunity to come to university and have critical minds and critical thinking. And so it's important for us to be able to see that these people, while we hail them as great, wonderful, amazing people, they also had some challenges and we have to assess them in a sense that we are very careful not to repeat because often, oftentimes we find ourselves in position of leadership and power and we are you know, learning from what history has left behind and literally copying some of this behavior without necessarily realizing the impact it has upon us if we are not able to be able to peel out what is a good behavior to copy and what it's not. So I'll, I'll, I'll read out the second quotation here because this one concerned uh, the U.S. and the formation of Liberia. So um, according to Claude Andrew Clegg, among those torn by the antipolar relationship between democratic ideals and a tyrannical dominion over slaves and those attracted to the concept of black removal was Thomas Jefferson, author of the Declaration of Independence, third president of the United States, and a Virginia planter. As early as 1776, Jefferson, a member of the Virginia legislation, legislature, had come to the conclusion that migration of blacks beyond American borders might resolve, in, might resolve his own moral dilemma as a revolutionary slaveholder and a free and and free the country from his unflattering quandary as well. So literally what the code is saying uh, is um, Liberia was founded on a back to Africa movement. And all these amazing states, statesmen, including James Monroe, former president of, of America, Jefferson, you know, president of, of, of America, uh, president and as well, the writer of the Declaration of Independence, these people came together and founded the American Colonization Society in 1816, and their goal was to take Africans, Black Africans that they had pulled out of Africa to be slaves for over 300 years, push them back to, to, to Africa because they needed, like Canada needed to solve the native problem, they needed to solve the Black or the slave problem in America. And the only way to do that was to Take them somewhere, let them create, let them go back to where they came from. Meanwhile, you've taken them over 300 years. Those people have been ripped apart from their families and cultures. They, 
lost identity, but you felt it was okay that you will ship them back to Africa to form what we now have today um, in, a, in the state of Liberia. And so um, the, ideal, the ideology and the thinking and the precepts or concepts behind the establishments of states and nation building in the US, in Australia, in Canada, and Liberia is very similar. Similar in a way that in terms that, um, I'll just read this out and then I will try to close so that we can have conversation. Similar in a sense that they are used or they have been used as apparatuses of violence, massacres, genocides, and conflicts. And again, when you go back to read the history of these countries, seldom do you hear or read about the encounters they had with indigenous people and the amount of uh, violence that resulted as, you know, through the process of dispossessing them and overcoming or overpowering them to take over their land. It's always been glorified as wonderful Americans, you know, living in, uh, you know, the uh, England and they were very happy about how the queen was or the monarchy was, was ruling them. And so they were looking for liberty and freedom. But when they came, what did they do? They established, of course, colonies um, under the, queen, the king's name or the queen's name. Um, they, they welcomed slavery into American culture for uh, economic gains. And then, of course, they, they decided to establish their great constitution. When you talk about American constitution today, that's one of the things everybody, oh, it's amazing. These people, they left this situation that they didn't like and they came and they found that this amazing constitution, amazing constitution, excuse me, a constitution that was founded devoid of rights of women, black people, and Native Americans. How is it then that we can sit as young people and continue to follow and propagate this rhetoric rather than evidence that, oh, this is a great constitution. Everybody should model their constitution after the American constitution, excuse me. I mean, the same can be said for Canada residential schools about how we treated um, indigenous people in, re and I will probably say we, are, I wasn't part of that. I'm not even going to put myself in that we, but as, as um, settlers and colonizers in Canada felt that the only way to exterminate native people or, or aboriginal people in Canada or strip them of their, of their culture, as the TRC report calls it, cultural genocide, is to place them somewhere else. Something that we would not do to ourselves is to brainwash them and make them, turn them into ourselves, what we want them to be like, what we want them to look like. And if you look at Australia, it was the same replication of stolen generation where the Australian government passed laws in 1911, literally to give half caste, and these were children literally again resulting from mostly rape or uh, sexual assaults, because how else would Aborig uh, a light-skinned Aboriginal kid or a mother of Aboriginal uh, heritage have a child that is light-skinned? when in fact they had no respect for these people's culture. I'm not saying that there were not cases where there were intermarriages, there were, but most likely uh, mixed race children came out of those kind of interactions. And then when they, when they were born, what you said to them is, we don't want you to tarnish the white race. So we're going to take you away from, because that's not a place for you to be growing up. That's not the culture. It's too primitive and it's not, we are ashamed to even be associated with you. Mind you, you came to these people culture. They welcome you. They allow you in, but now you've turned into something else and took them away from uh, 1911 to 1975 or so. I mean, that's like, so many years, just literally recently, over 50,000 indigenous uh, uh, Australians were pulled away from their families and, and put into white families so that according to A.O. Neville, they had to breed the indigeneity out of them and make them pure white. Anyway, so um, 
that was one of the one of the thread or one of the tools that people colonizers used to inflict systematic violence. Another tool was certainly the law. They always went to parliament. People raised their hands up and agreed that a law should be passed. So another issue for you to think about when people tell you, oh, it's the law, I'm just doing my job. Ask them which law and who made that law for who? Because that law that has been made in itself naturally is very discriminatory. And so don't come tell me that it's a fair law or it's a law that dispense justice equally. You know, taking, making a law because some people go and say we are in a majority and so then we should pass it into law. That will remove a child away from their family. How is that law a good law and that somebody should turn around and quote to me that it's the law. I don't believe in those kind of law. And the other thing is through education, religion, and language. And of course, like I said, the residential school in Canada extracted or uh, took indigenous uh, uh, Canadian children away from their family, put them into residential schools, and denied them of their culture, denied them of speaking their language. And the same was done in Liberia. It's just, I, I don't have too much time to go into this, but another fascinating information for you to learn. Being in Africa and being black doesn't mean that we don't do or copy the exact same thing that, was, that is being done in Western culture. And Liberia is an example of that. And most time people will explain that, oh, because they were in, you know, this situation of slavery for 300 years plus. And when it came back to Africa, they knew nothing but to repeat the plantation mentality where, you know, what they actually observed in America. So that's some kind of justification for them, but I don't support that argument either. Um, another thing was political and uh, uh, social exclusion. So in the system, Think about it, when you go to Ottawa, when you go to the parliament, do you actually see, oh, well, maybe Justin Trudeau has done a little bit of a good job. I, I see, you know, our new uh, uh, attorney general is, is, is an indigenous Canadian from BC. That's quite impressive. But if you look through our history in Canada, do you really see Aboriginal Canadian represented in politics? Ask Ask yourself why. Somebody again would say, hey, you're playing a racial card. It's not that it's just not qualified. Why? Oh, well, they didn't go to school for it. Why? Oh, well, you know, because they like to drink and they always, why? Keep asking why until you get to the bottom of it. You realize that it is a serious historical systemic problem. And it's not just, you know, with these simplistic answers, oh, Aboriginal people are lazy. Oh, they don't like to work. They like to drink. It didn't happen like that. It did not have the culture like that when, uh, before settlers arrived. Certainly, not that they were perfect, but the repercussions of what we are saying from colonization wasn't existing at that time. I could go on and on and on, and actually I wrote a lot more to say to you, but unfortunately we don't have too much time, so I certainly wanted to leave a few minutes for you to engage and have a couple of discussions on that. Thank you, Veronica. Um, sorry, you can't see me. <laughs> I can see you. It's cut off. The <laughs> uh, so lately I've been reading um, a little bit of Franz Fanon, that you may have heard of. Um, and one of the things that he talks about a lot um, is how colonial uh, elites come over and then they sort of replicate the ideologies that they bring with them um, within the indigenous societies, which often means that they end up creating indigenous elites that internalize these narratives of racial superiority, um, which sort of justify their position in society. Um, so to what, I mean, it's a bit different in the context of Liberia because the elites that were coming over, the colonists who, who came to that country initially were themselves black or were considered black. So, um, but they do seem to have already internalized those those narratives. Um, and that's, I think, one of the things that uh, led to the, the way that Liberia has developed historically. But what, to what extent do you think that that process has continued in, in modern Liberia and in the political elites? 
That's a very good question. And if I tell you sometimes I stay up late at night, it will be because of some of these things. And Liberia personally is a big conundrum for me. Um, internal conflict, a lot, a lot, a lot of it. I go through being a, you know, born and bred Liberian, but also being very critical of, you know, reinventing the colonial or elite uh, wheels in that country. And that's why we had 14 years of civil war, because exactly what Fano is explaining. Fano, oh my God, I adore that man. I just wish he had, I, I wish he hadn't died. He's one of the best brains Africa has ever had. And I just wish that younger generation, because I have lost hope in our older generation. I don't think if you look at a continent, that's exactly what you explain is existing. And Liberia specifically, I don't know whether we have any hope of that if especially young people are almost never, ever given opportunity to lead. Almost never, ever. You look at our the continent as a whole, like they're all, grand, I call them grandfather leaders or presidents. It's just, and I always imagine how does Ellie Johnson Zalif feels when she goes for those meetings, but even at that, she's almost 74 years old. Like she's a great grandmother. She could probably be a great grandmother, you know? And younger generation who are maybe able to be strong enough, build the confidence and, and, and criticize those elite and negative parts of our culture that we don't want to continue. I'm sorry, you don't end up living very long in those cultures because you will be removed either through your own people or through some external means who want to continue keeping us in a, in a violent will so that extraction of the natural resources is, you know, continuing and people continue to live in poverty. So that's the story of Africa. That's the story of Liberia. And it takes young people who are strong, who are critical thinking and willing to be able to speak out against these issues to say, look, we should not continue in this way. Fine, fair enough that all these things happen to our ancestors. They treated them horribly and we should continue to fight for justice where there needs to be justice. But to reinvent and continue to propagate this elite culture where we are literally picking up a system from the West and dumping it down there and doing the exact same thing I don't, I don't know who is better, you know, for us to then say that, oh, this person is being racist against me. But you are creating a class system that is not, I mean, collectively, not very different from what, you know, the racism or the uh, repercussions of racism will inflict on people. So it's a very good question. Um, I oftentimes try to engage my own people all the time to talk about these issues because, again, this unconscious racism or unconscious bias I told you about, we carry it around too. We, we, we re-propagate or continue to propagate um, colonial elite attitudes and perceptions in the way we behave, the way we talk to each other. I mean, you could go to Liberia and somebody would say to you, Oh, stop speaking your local language. It sounds like you're a bush girl. And that's a Liberian talk. And this is exactly what Fan Fano was talking about. You know, uh, um, necritude and, and this whole elite culture of black people thinking that they, because they went abroad. And Ngogi Waitiango talked about it too, also in his book on decolonizing the mind you know, where he uses languages as, as or language as a politics of the elite. And this is African elite. I mean, the colonizers used it too, but we are propagating those kind of messages because that's what we had learned. And so we don't stop to think about how it continues this cycle of subjugation and oppression. And that's what a continent is just riff, riff with, you know, a lot of violence because, yeah.
Good question. Thank you. Anybody else? Um, uh, so I, I really like what you said earlier about uh, Churchill and how sort of he did not just Linus and as you know, the hero of Britain and his technical form and whatnot, but that he had a, a less uh, pleasant side as well. And I've been reading a lot about, um, well, not a lot, but I, I learned about this through work and you'll probably know more about this because you're in the States. Um, I've been reading about the movements on US campuses to remove you know, the statues of the Fathers of Confederation or rename the, the building on, I forget which university it was, but it was named after Woodrow Wilson because you know, they were all, uh, they were racist or they were slave owners, et cetera. And the, the rebuttal to that debate is usually, well, you know, good luck finding someone from back in the day who wasn't racist. <laughs> and uh, does that then mean that, you know, we shouldn't, um, you know, we shouldn't have any kind of national heroes or, you know, put up any figures from the past on the pedestal. And I'm just wondering what your thoughts, like where you stand in on that debate and what your thoughts are about, um, I guess, the public commemoration in, uh, in the West of the, of the national narrative. That's another good question. You know, thank you again for raising that. Um, do you guys remember our famous Canadian who was a writer and was very much responsible for residential schools? He was in Parliament. Johnny McDonald? It's not McDonald. If you call him, I just forget his name, but he was a writer too. Oh, Pierre Huh? No. Uh, was he a newspaper publisher by any chance? He, he, he used to write a lot, but he was, I think he was, he was a indigenous, how do they call it, uh, indigenous protector or something like that for many, many years. And I, I raised this because most of the time, you know, the question she's talking about or she's, she's asked, we like to sometimes see these problems as isolated problems but they're very and i think that's why i wanted to have this thread and and break some of those preconceptions that or oh, certain thing can only happen in canada because it's white people and it's indigenous people but it's a human condition human being black and white we are responsible for a lot of harm and pain and destruction and when we, uh, when we decide to address or to respond to some of these issues, it's important for us to take that human condition approach. Because when we start to think about it as, oh, it's over there, oh, it's just the indigenous people that it's happening to, it's not really true. You know, because the exact same thing of what she's saying happening again, because Canada is very good. We're very good at thinking, oh, well, it's happening in South Africa with Cecil Rhodes. It's not in... Canadians were never slave owners, you know, I'm like, you kidding me? You know, who were the Brits who came over here and you think they never owned slaves and you think you never contributed to those things? And if you not, you know, overtly racism, maybe, but what about what you did to the indigenous people collectively? How is that really, really different? It's the same form of dehumanizing experiences like mayhem, like, you can't separate these things. We have to look at them as a systemic issue. And when we want to solve them, or we want not solve, because I don't think we can solve them, but when we want to address or respond to them, it's important for us to see those threats so that it brings out a comprehensive approach into doing those things. So a long <laughs> response to your, to your question, but how I feel is, Personally, I mean, as a black person and South Af black South African, the way they felt about Cecil Rhodes or the way they feel about Cecil Rhodes is not the same with the white Africans feel about Cecil Rhodes. It's important that when you're doing things like this, and that's the problem with nation building and state building that I also discuss in my PhD thesis. You know, when you exclude people from nation building, these are some of the things that will happen after hundreds and, you know, centuries. Because you think in your eyes, you see them as heroes, but not what, what, after what they've done to indigenous people or uh, black South Africans, there is no way they can be hailed or paraded as heroes. 
He was not a good, he was a colonizer. He was a colonist. He did a lot, he, he, he didn't like black people. And so to have him at the, and I've been to UCT, University of Cape Town, I've, I've actually taken a picture at that statue, but I was very, very excited when the students actually did what they did and made a petition for that to come down. We need to do the same thing in Canada. We need to do the same thing in Australia. We need to do the same thing in Liberia. Oh, God help me if I would ever get involved in any of those kind of projects in Liberia. We have so many of them. You know, slaves came back. They were enslaved for over 300 years. They came back with such trauma and pain in their spirit. Their spirit is broken. But Liberia freed, they call themselves free slaves. They were the first to name the capital city of Liberia, Monrovia, named after James Monroe, because he was in state and he was part of the formation of the American Colonization Society in 1816. But I don't want people who is enslaved me to be looked, at, looked upon as heroes. How does that help your psyche? And people think it's like, it's not related. It is related. It's very important. And we've done that across Canada too. We heal, I just keep forgetting his name. I'll try to remember his name. I'll send it to Adi so Adi can share with you guys. But you know, he was a very mean person and we move his job was literally to remove every Aboriginal kid and put them into residential school. But yet he's been hailed as this great Canadian. We need to change that. So that's my view. You know, maybe they've gotten their time in history for however years they've spent being up on a statue or, you know, being recorded in history. But maybe it's time that we remove that. Maybe speak to Indigenous Canadian. Maybe speak to Black South African, ask them what they think. And like Ronald Dawkins state, and I really like his, his quotation on, on when he talked about the rule of law and constitutional law. What he says is, how can we ever hold ourselves up to the values and the, the, the utterance of people who were dead 300, 400 years ago? And we said, this is our constitution. What about the people who are born today and have different views and values about things? In this mindset, we create that it's impossible to change. Like we've invented, as human beings, we've invented these things and then we make it impossible to uninvent them. It's not impossible. We created these systems. You know, I'm not saying I change every aspect of the constitution, but maybe after a hundred years, sit back and say, excuse me, this is no more reflection of what we thought about when those people came, you know, in the early 1400s or 1500s. This has been 300 years now. Maybe we should change things. That's what, for me, I believe that those are the changes that this generation should be fighting for, reinventing and reaccommodating you know, in, in creating a society of inclusiveness in general. Um, I actually have another one. Uh, <laughs> so there's a lot of uh, sort of initiatives that are funded, funded or um, uh, helped by Western governments, uh, sort of governance initiatives in Africa and by um, Western non-governmental organizations uh, that I think have sort of the, the aim of undoing some of the damage that was done by colonists um, in, the, in that continent. But I just wanted to ask you, to what extent do you think that it's possible um, for people from the West to actually uh, to do that, to be helpful in that regard, um, given that we still have this these, narrat these unconscious uh, racist narratives that we're sort of carrying with us? Um, do you think that there is a limit to, to how helpful uh, Western involvement trying to, uh, to, to rectify some of the problems of govern, governance uh, 
and other problems that are in Africa can be, or is that something that we should be trying to do, or should we be trying to address our own problems first? Good question. I mean, I read it like this. This is just so, I just, I wish I was there um, for us to, because I, I, I feel some, some kind of abstraction, you know, I'm too far away and I'm not getting that, you know, energy, but I really like the questions you're asking. That's a very, very good question again. And it often comes, I mean, Tambisa Moyo has written about this when she got the fame for, you know, dead aid and don't help Africa, let Africans help themselves. Again, it's one of those areas I personally get a lot conflicted internally because while I do believe that, you know, there is a, there are some instances where there are really genuine exchange happening in Western governments. I, I, I know of some European governments that are doing some really good work, especially Scandinavian governments. I know that some of them, like Sweden, Norway, Denmark, when it goes to, when it recent last 10, 15 years, when it goes to the continent and they invest, they come up with really good um, conditions in a sense that one of the, I think it was in Uganda or Tanzania, I can remember, don't quote me on the country, but they did say, until you can get your human rights act together, we won't give you this amount of money. Or there was another instance, it was an environmental problem. Until you can put provisions in this uh, uh, contract that whatever proceeds come from this, you will build schools, you will build roads, you will do this. We are not going to continue with the project. You know, and, and what is, is what is now called uh, corporate responsibility. And I think the UN is also trying to grab onto that concept and disseminate it in a way that will make governments responsible. But how many states care about those things? We live in a very greedy capitalist society and very selfish society where people care only about self-interest. When Canada is, I mean, why did we get rid of CEDA? When Canada is coming to a country, well, it's the whole balkanizing idea. If you're not part of the Commonwealth, we are not going to come in. And if we're not going to get this or we're not going to get that, we're not going to do this. I agree. I understand that, you know, as a human being, you need to think about your back. You need to care about yourself. But when are we ever going to get beyond the self-glorification, the self, you know, those famous blogs we see all the time is one white kid in the middle of dirty little African kids changing the world. Like, when are we ever going to realize that for change to come, honestly, for a long term, it has to come from inside, yeah. It's not external at all. This is my take. Because for me, what I constantly do is have time with myself to reflect and be critical. When I was poor, when I didn't have, you know, I was escaping war and I didn't have food, I didn't have that time to do that. And unfortunately, that's what most African children will find themselves, or people, women, will find themselves in. They're in a situation where they're constantly thinking about what to eat the next moment, that they seldom have time to the extra time to do this critical thinking. And for me, I've had that opportunity to leave and have education. That's what I spend my time doing. Thinking about why are things the way they are? Why would I embrace a million dollar from say the US government? I would use that money to buy arms from China or Russia, and then I will go and declare war, internal war in my own country, change my country's constitution. I was probably said two years, uh, four years for term, or three terms for or four years each, but I'll make it three or five terms and cause a commotion. And then while that conflict is going on, then I will sign deal with other investors that can come in and take the diamonds and take the gold and take the timber or Bill Gates. 
you know, every time I hear Bill Gates Foundation giving money to Africa, I just weep. I know it breaks my heart so much because I know that money will never trickle down. I just know it. It never, the trickle down effect does not happen in Africa. It never happens. And so until we are able to fight, and I mean Africans, sacrifice, and create an environment where we can respect each other and extend access to social resources to everybody. If it's everybody should have elementary school education, everybody. If everybody can go to university, then fine. We, stop. we don't put money in that because we haven't gotten there yet. But to have a 65% illiteracy rate and almost 80% unemployment rate, like in Liberia, and then you get billions of dollars donated to youth, you know, from EU, from the US, and and you still go back to Liberia and you can't find a fitting road in the country. Excuse me? It has to come from inside. And until Africans and mostly African leaders are willing to care about the people, it may sound simplistic, but that's the bottom line. There are a few African presidents that I respect a lot, and certainly Nelson Mandela, he did a good job. Definitely Jerry John Rawlings, I think he did a fantastic job. He's not a perfect human being, but he's certainly a good, he was a good leader who had Ghanaians at heart. But if the head is rotten, my mom would say, would say if the, the head of the fish is rotten, believe me, the whole body is rotten. So until African leaders can really stop to think about how much they're destroying that continent and local people like myself who have had opportunity can be critical of those leaders who are not doing the right thing and make sacrifices to go back home and contribute our quota ain't going to happen. Like Gandhi said, if not you, who? Who are Africans expecting to do, make change for them? Who? America, Canada cannot make change for Africa. Africans have to make the changes for themselves. Thank you so much again, Veronica. We really appreciate your time, especially with all the stuff you have. I found, yeah. I found the name that you're looking for. Uh-huh. Duncan Campbell Scott. That's him! <laughs> so, yeah, he was Deputy Superintendent of Indian Affairs and was advocating for assimilation. Thank you. That's him. Yes, Duncan Campbell. Yes, that's him. Thank you. That was very smart. <laughs> uh, Thank you, guys. Thank you, so Thank you again. Good luck with your dissertation, and we hope to be in touch still. Yeah, thank you so much. This was a great opportunity. I hope to see you guys sometime when I'm at UBC. Yes, and you're coming to Vancouver next week, right? Yep. For, she's getting an award. Oh. Congratulations. Thank you. Maybe we can catch you then. But uh, uh, in the meantime, goodbye and have a great uh, daytime, right? Yeah, day. Yes. <laughs> yes. Bye. Bye. Thank you for having me.